I'd like to have Dr. Bloodworth uh, begin speaking. Uh, we're going to try to answer uh, as many questions uh, about the consolidation as we know. Uh, I do think all of you need to uh, remember that both Dr. Bloodworth and I are also newcomers to the process. Uh, and so we may not have all the answers, but we'd like to listen to all the questions and see how far we can go. Dr. Bloodworth? All right, let's see. Go Jazz. <laughs> Just a little bit of what we will bring to the merger. Yeah. We get to bring the animal. Uh, I get to wear my national championship ring, although by 5 o'clock tonight this left arm may be hurting from that. It's a pleasure to see you. Of course, some of you know me, a lot of you don't know me. I've been in Augusta a long time. I'm in my 19th year as president at Augusta State University. It's a pleasure to see you. I'm going to say this, too. It's a pleasure to be here in the Lee Auditorium because there's a connection between us. Uh, this, uh, this facility is named after <coughs> Natalie and Lansing Lee, who also endowed a scholarship at Augusta State University. It's a very unusual scholarship. You know, we accept students with a wide, wide range of ability. So this is a scholarship that actually rewards students who start without great academic promise, but make academic achievements. It's more of a reward than a scholarship. It's the Natalie and Lansing Lee Scholarship for students of that kind. So there's a nice little connection here uh, between us, and maybe that says something about the mission of Augusta State University, which is to keep the door open fairly wide, provide as much support as possible to help human beings be successful in their life and help us all. But I don't know much about George Hill Sciences University, so I'm here today eager to hear your questions, and maybe eager to hear my own answers, <laughs> uh, because I know I'm. I, you know, the deal here is that I, I stepped down as president at Augusta State University on June 30th, but I, I remain with the institution as professor of English and American Studies for I don't know how long. So what, what we're doing here, I will continue to be a part of. So I'm really interested in how I can help uh, between now and June 30th and thereafter. And so in order for me to be helpful, I need to know as much as I can that I don't now know about the issues, concerns, potentials, and possibilities of this merger, especially from people at Georgia Health Sciences University. Dr. Zies. Dr. Woodworth said it uh, much better than I could have. Uh, that is why his degree is in English, American English, which is it's a great, uh, it's one of my uh, desires to follow. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about what we know uh, and what uh, maybe some of the myths uh, that are out there. And then I'd really like uh, to open the floor for questions, because that's really, I think, what's the uh, value of today. We do know that the Board of Regents uh, has mandated the consolidation of uh, Augusta State University and Georgia Health Sciences University. They've done this as a part of a uh, statewide analysis of campuses that could synergize uh, and could become uh, more effective and more efficient. And of course, we are one of four pairs of institutions across the state that are going to be facing this. Now, we also know that this is a unique consolidation, uh, that we in that uh, statewide plan, which is really, I think, a very bold uh, and uh, very future-oriented plan, we are unique. We are unique because primarily Augusta State University and Georgia Health Sciences University are synergistic. We don't really compete, right, uh, in the vast majority of programs. Uh, we don't compete in almost anything, right? Uh, as somebody asked me, what are we going to call our mascot, I thought, we don't have one. You know, what is our sports team? Well, we don't have one either. We have no athletic department and so on and so forth. So the truth is that we are a different type of consolidation than what is being presented. And that means that the opportunities here are extraordinary. We also know that the 
regions have asked us to create a whole new university, a comprehensive university, a university that provides education to undergraduates, that continues to serve as access and that first entry to our community and actually to large parts of the state, but also is able to provide the graduate uh, and the research programs that large universities command. And so it is a new university. This is not about creating a overgrown health system, just as the Health Sciences University, the GHSU that is today, is not an overgrown medical school. At the end of the day, we are creating a totally new university whose rules and regulations, whose future follows that of other great American research universities. Now, when I say research university, everybody says, wait a minute, does that mean we all have to do research? And for all of you who have been here for the past 18 months, that conversation, of course, is the same conversation we've had with many, many faculty who are dedicated to education and training, but who do not necessarily do lots of research. They may have scholarship, but not research. And the answer to you, of course, and you know this answer already, is that a research university means a part of the mission of the university is to do research. But that does not mean that every faculty member does research. Not every faculty member will do clinical work. And certainly not every faculty, medicine, uh, uh, faculty uh, member will teach American English. Because at the end of the day, we are and have different specialties and different skills. A university, first and foremost, is for, the val is for the students, is for the education and training of students, the future generations. That's why universities are so incredibly powerful. And this consolidation allows us to become a true, fully-fledged, comprehensive research university. Now, I will share with you a couple of thoughts that have been circulated, concerns that I think have been circulated. One, what will happen to the Augusta State University programs? Well, they will grow. There is absolutely no value in consolidating our campuses if we are not going to grow. This is not about becoming smaller. This is about becoming bigger. There are a lot of synergies between the health sciences and the liberal arts, MD, MBAs, and artistic endeavors. Of course, we here at GHSU have the number one or number two medical illustration department in the country. So there's lots of synergies and, and other specialties that can be, uh, uh, that, that other uh, 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 collaborations can occur. I mean, Dr. Bloodworth himself is going to be teaching a class in medicine and English, or literature, I should say. But the point really is that that's just part of the benefit. The biggest benefit is that all of a sudden, we will be part of a large, comprehensive university with an incredibly bright future. But the growth will be in all sectors. This is not about replacing one university with another. This is not about having an overgrown health sciences university. That would be a travesty. And that is not the Board of Regents' goal. That is not the Chancellor's goal. Certainly not my goal, not Dr. Bloodworth's goal. Okay. So that's just a little bit about uh, what we know and what we are facing in the future. Uh, will this be difficult? Absolutely. Will there be bumps in the road? Many. Will the future be incredible? Absolutely. How many times have you been part of the creation of a new university? How many here? Please raise your hand. Because this is a one in a lifetime opportunity to do it right. To do it right for Augusta, to do it right for Georgia, but most of all, to do it right for our students. So. With that, I'd like to just open the floor for questions for Dr. Bloodworth and I. 
So I've uh, wished for many years that uh, our students, our PhD students, had access to the uh, mathematics and computer sciences department at, at ASU. It's a strong department. Uh, Dr. Robinson is very pro-collaborative, um, great to work with. So my question is, how soon can we begin working on opening up course catalogs and getting these types of things to, to start happening? Uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll mention, collaboration should start yesterday. Okay, as you know, and you've been doing this, and so Michael, I think you, you've been doing a great job there. The merger will have to be finalized and approved by SACS for us to have unified catalogs so that we have a university-wide catalog. So, you know, it would be a bit of a hubris to tell you when that would occur. Uh, we'd like to have that all done within the next 18 months. Uh, a lot remains to be done. But to have a uniform catalog, uh, you would have to have SACS approval of a unified one university. But between now and then, there is nothing that tells us that we cannot begin to publicize all of the things that each of our institutions brings to the table to really create the greater. And I appreciate you bringing that up. So catalogs, I realize that to get the entire catalog uh, merged is a, is a Herculean task. But we've already collaborated with that department in terms of uh, publications. But even sharing a course, just starting piecemeal. Uh, for example, I'd love our students to be able to take mathematical modeling course in that department. So maybe even starting a small bit at a time, one course at a time might be a way to. Dr. To Bloodworth go. is going to be more of an expert on this, but I can tell you that we've had many of our students today here want to partake of the offerings on the ASU campus, even today, in the arts, in the business. And because we are students, still two different institutions, they do have to enroll in two different institutions. Mm -hmm. And therein lies, of course, the power of what we're talking about. But for the time being, unfortunately, they will have to continue to do that until we are one institution. So, Dr. Bloodworth, is that uh, Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't see our registrar in the audience. I don't know what the number is or the number of Georgia Health Science students who are in our classes now. but. No, that is already happening. It will be easier in the future. It'll be very much easier. Thank you. Other questions? Laura? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a little cold. I think this is a unique opportunity for both of our institutions to come together and to really create some collaborative educational programs for our students. But one of the questions I have is about faculty governance. We've got faculty senate, university faculty senate, and then at ASU. Um, so how do we merge the governance of the faculty, and how do we bring both of those groups of faculty together for a unified voice? I'll, I'll, I'll Go ahead. try to respond to that. I think that's incredibly important to do. We have a, I think it's probably the right word, a unique system of faculty governance at Augusta State. You know, it's unique, it's a little old-fashioned. Uh, our faculty make d decisions finally in meetings of the faculty as a whole. There is enormous engagement between our faculty and all of the policies and actions on campus. And we were able to do that because, well, we're a little smaller, we're cohesive, there's a great deal of cross-communication all the time on campus. Your system is different. Now, I don't know how the two systems, separate systems of faculty governance now will become one unified system. I know that it has to happen, though. And we have to, to start as soon as possible, yesterday maybe, figuring out how to make that work. So, so uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to echo Dr. Bloodworth's uh, uh, comments. There are lots of things that we do not know. There's much that we don't know. Um, faculty governance, promotion and tenure, these other issues all are complex issues. But I will also say that at Georgia Health Sciences University, we've been dealing with this issue, particularly about promotion and tenure. You know, we have obviously a, we are a research institution, uh, but again, many, many, many of our faculty are dedicated to the task that they were brought in, which is the education and training of students. And we are now beginning to look at, and in fact, our own faculty senate is looking at how promotion and tenure needs to be updated in the context of the 20th century and in the context of who we are. 
So I think that that process, Laura, will actually now be expanded to include a much broader uh, group of colleagues uh, uh, that will have to be uh, uh, assessed. We will probably have to move to a much more centralized, uh, 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 we talked about earlier, I mean, currently uh, the promotion and tenure basically stops at the colleges uh, and there is no sort of uniform institutional one. Most big universities, in fact, all of them have those layers and then they have just sort of a institution-wide promotion and tenure uh, uh, type of assessment. The measures are different. It varies according to who you are and what you are. I'm not going to try to spell it out because it's, it's a complex issue, but I think you have pointed out to one of those things that have to be addressed, as Dr. Bloodworth says, has to happen. In terms of a practical question, um, we're talking about things that could have or should have been happening yesterday. Um, is there any harm in the two groups of people getting together and meeting each other and just talking about how we do business now so we can be familiar with? So, so the answer is, uh, I think that the more we can dialogue between groups, the better it will be. Um, the, the, you know, the University System of Georgia and the Chancellor's Office have specified a process, which is to appoint a uh, implementation committee, implementation group uh, that is made by appointees that Dr. Bloodworth and I put on the committee. But we know that that committee, which will include only about 20 people, can't really do it all, right? That may be an oversight committee, but at the end of the day, that committee will have to have multiple and many work groups, task forces with you know, defined staff and assessing problems and looking at milestones. And all of you have been that partaking in part of this over the last 18 months at GHSU as we have been through an integration and a growth phase. So, uh, I don't think that there's any problem at all with that. I, I do know that we, Dr. Bloodworth and I, haven't received our full marching orders about how this is going to be done. I also need everybody again to understand that we are forging new ground. There is no prescription out there. We're going to have to do this right. But I think really reaching to your colleagues is probably not a bad idea. Understanding that there will be a process that, that, that will be in place. Thank you. Thank you. President Aziz and President Bloodworth, uh, thank you very much for leading this uh, very important uh, transformation and it really opens up uh, great, great new opportunities. And on a personal note, I can uh, tell you that I've been re reviewing and, and working on some official documents here at the university and we are in a desperate need for English professors here at Georgia Health Sciences <laughs> University. <laughs> I have a, a practical question that as the merger happens, I'm sure there are many administrative aspects of that, but uh, we should also think about uh, promoting relationships between departments and colleges. And I wonder if both of you see opportunities emerging in the near future. I mean, this is all about opportunities of collaboration. Uh, by the way, uh, Bill, that is uh, our Dean of the School of Public Health, Dr. Ballas, who, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, uh, that's right, uh, Allied Health Science. Oop, oop, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so um, the, the reality is that the sooner the faculty collaborate and work together, the better this will be. Remember that at the end of the day, the biggest single hurdle, the single hurdle we will face is how do we bring faculty cultures together in a university? But for those of you who have worked in large universities, you know that the faculty cultures differ anyway. If you go to UGA, right, the faculty who are dealing with the undergraduate programs will overlap some with the graduate programs, but not necessarily extensively. I don't think that the students will be a problem. The students gain tremendous access, <coughs> tremendous diversity in their offerings, tremendous uh, uh, opportunities. But again, students are different, right? My daughter, who's at ASU, who's now gone into her third major as she searches for who she is, is very different than the medical student that applies and gets in, here and everywhere. So the student issue is not going to be as difficult as people assume. We will have to address it, but in, at the end of the day, it is our faculty cultures, our collaborations, our collegiality that needs to be worked on. And the sooner we begin to do that, because the opportunities are real and are there, the better we will be. 
There's a lot of collaboration already. You know, Dr. Steve Hobbs is out here, past chair of our Department of Psychology, where there's a strong emphasis on, on health psychology. Uh, we've got, uh, your place is always hiring our faculty to do something, and I'm always asking, <laughs> are, you, are you paying them enough? Uh, oh, to, to remember, do it, you research know. is about I, collaboration. My, <laughs> Monday afternoon, I'm walking around thinking about these things because I've got to do a little talk downtown. Tuesday morning, I'm walking around All Good Hall and I'm looking, and on a table, I see a listing of our current courses in philosophy. Three of them. One of them, philosophy 4950. Now, Dr. Stephen Weiss is here. Uh, 4950, Philosophy and Medicine, uh, offered by our philosopher and his colleague at Georgia Health Sciences University. You know, I walk into our Department of Communications and Professional Writing, and they, they think, we really like the fact that we're now developing this course in medical communication. I go to uh, uh, walk down the halls in our Department of English and Foreign Language, and our Spanish faculty are looking at something on the wall which is medical Spanish. So, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of little things that are happening that may really indeed be little, but offer us the opportunity to build upon as we go forward. But, but I do want to stress that this is not about, you know, getting everything in the liberal arts and the business school and the education school and in the many other schools that will be created to have a health bent. As you create big universities, there will be natural collaborations and inclinations. Georgia Tech naturally will gravitate toward the engineering, but they have solid, nationally known liberal arts programs. UGA, of course, will naturally gravitate to the agricultures and the environmental sciences, but UGA has nationally and recognized liberal arts programs. This is not about sort of medicalizing or, or creating everything to be in the health sciences. These are just opportunities that exist for collaboration, and those are mutual. But this is also about growing our liberal arts offering by growing our business offerings, our educational offerings, and again, many of our other arts and sciences that we need to emphasize. Other questions? Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. So many of you may know that the PhD students here at GHSU have sort of a double role. First and foremost, we're students, but we're also employees. So from the employee standpoint, I like all the opportunities you talked about earlier. But from a student perspective, by talking in the student government um, meeting on Monday, we had kind of a sense of some of us got enrolled while the university was named MCG. Now we at DHSU. I hope to graduate within the next year and a half, so I don't know what the name is going to be then. Can you please comment on these concerns current students may have regarding the name and regarding our diplomas and what the worth of those will be in the future? How many times has that question been asked recently? Uh, nobody knows the answer. Everybody has an opinion. You know, I uh, read a lot in American history, and there's a, there's a format for titles of books and articles, in, especially in American history. It'll have the subject. You know, it'll be something like healthcare policy colon continuity and change. Uh, we know the change is coming. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of a fan of continuity, too, that you take along with you the best that you've always had. So all I'm hoping for in the name and in how we are seen is that, let's see. Uh, I'm not, I won't be literary. Uh, <laughs> but we have to take what we have been with us as we go forward. In as much as we can, because our strength lies not only what we can do in the future, but the foundations that we built in the past. So I hope that whatever we do, name-wise, carries that as well. You know, new, new world, yes, but there's a lot of continuity here that needs to take place. A lot of pride in place and accomplishments in people. 
So I'm just, I'm just going to say that, uh, that I hope we move forward that way. So I think, I think Dr. Bloodworth uh, said it correctly, and that is that we don't know. But let me, let me answer a couple of things. You asked two questions, really. What is the name and what is the value? Now, I will tell you that the diploma of the students of today and those that have received it in the past will be worth much more than if we were just a standalone health sciences university or a standalone comprehensive university like ASU. So by far, no doubt, the value of that diploma, 20 years from now, because that's the value. When you say, I came from X, that will mean a lot more than it does today. Undoubtedly, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind. The name will be determined later. You know, I will have to do, you know, a rose by any other name, but, but the reality is we will have to come up with a name that honors tradition, but also is future-oriented, that 20 years from now, people will say, we know what that is. You know, we dealt with this in the medical college name because the medical college name is one that we honor, we have kept. But at the end of the day, we didn't know if we were talking about the medical school or we were talking about the university. And half the time when you'd say Medical College of Georgia, you'd actually be speaking about the university, and half the time you'd actually be speaking about the medical school. And that was confusing because it gave the impression to everybody that we were somewhat an overgrown medical school. And we are not. But I can't tell you what the name will be. But we have a strategy in place already, right, that we've used. You'll have three diplomas with different names. <laughs> and you can roll them out whenever you'd like. Who, is, who am I talking to? Look at this one. The reality is the value of your diploma is going to be worth a lot more 10 years from now. And that's the key. Thank you. Three things. The, uh, the first is, following up on that, you worked very hard to get us a name that would be recognized nationally as a health sciences university. Do you think it's important that we somehow have the word health or science in our ultimate name? You know uh, what? I, 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 I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this repeatedly. I have no prejudice about what the name should be. The process will be collaborative. The process will have outside consultants who will help us brand ourselves and so on and so forth. But, but my guess is that it won't have health in it. Okay? We are a university. And let, me just, let me just be sure we all understand what we are creating. We are not creating an overgrown health sciences university like we were not creating an overgrown medical school before. We are creating a true, comprehensive research university. So that would be my guess. Having said that, this will be a collaborative process with outside people, and at the end of the day, the name will be the last thing that we decide upon because we need it for SACS accreditation. We, you can't just go to SACS with no name on it. The, the second question is, this is a pretty monumental decision, and would you comment on the fact that the first public discussion of this really is occurring after it's a done deal? Uh, I'm sorry, you want to repeat that? I say that this is a pretty big decision we've made that has been made for us, and yet the first public discussion involving the faculty and the rest of us is occurring after it is a fait accompli. And I'm going to have Dr. Bloodworth take that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll comment afterwards. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> what was the question again? Tell me again. <laughs> This is the standard response. You, know, you, wear, you wear the questioner out. What was that question again? Why are we discussing this only after it's a done deal? The, the, the faculty the, the, the has the not been involved. The, yeah, yeah, yes. because that's a, the consolidation, consolidation has not, not been discussed name. publicly, <coughs> certainly right. by the faculty. You know what counts <laughs> is, <clears throat> what was the question? What you do counts. How you do it counts a whole lot more. So we know what we're doing, whether we all chose to do this. Well, we don't answer that question. A lot of people didn't choose to do this. But the question now is, we're doing it 
how do we do it, how do we do it as well as possible, how do we get the greatest value out of what we're going to do and get that value out of it and how we do it. So, uh, Dr. Bloodworth states it correctly. At this point, we all need to be future-oriented and figure out how to get this done right. But let me try to answer your question. Um, to be fair, um, you know, Dr. Bloodworth and I were, were brought to this a little later. This is a, this is a university run by a university system, Board of Regents and a Chancellor. They make decisions that are strategic that they decide on. This is not, and to be fair, I may uh, go out on a limb this, but this is not about popular approval. Okay? So my guess is that they went through extensive deliberations and studies. Uh, they uh, did this carefully. They made these decisions. The chancellor had announced as one of their, his first initiatives that he would be looking at this. Uh, and so I can't really either defend or reprove that because at the end of the day, it is their job, like it is my job or Dr. Bloodworth's job, to make tough decisions that need to be done. What I do know is that we have been given this mandate, and Dr. Bloodworth and my job is to make this happen as effectively and as efficiently and as fruitfully as possible. Uh, there are lots of discussions and lots of things that still need to be decided that we're involving the community. The committee's uh, implementation committee, for example, will have uh, community representatives on it. Uh, but I can't speak to what's been happened. I can only speak to the fact that this is our mandate and we're going to make sure that it happens. Having said that, and maybe a little bit sort of bypassing the question, because frankly, as I said before, Dr. Bloodworth and I were brought also, you know, not necessarily part of that discussion, I do believe that this is the right thing. I do believe that this is the right thing for Georgia, for our students, for our community, for the nation. And I do think that the future is extraordinary and that the opportunity that we've been handed with a great degree of courage by the Board of Regents is an extraordinary one that we need to embrace. I don't want anybody to think that I think anything other than that. But again, people have to make decisions. The Board of Regents and the Chancellor made their own, uh, and they did their own deliberations in the manner that they felt necessary. And lastly, many of us have been involved uh, remotely in developing the branch campus up at Athens. And many have thought for a long time that ultimately that would be the University of Georgia School of Medicine. Do you envision we will be competing in the, in the future sometime with the University of Georgia School of Medicine? You know, I, I wish I, you know, I could read the future as well. My stock portfolio would be a heck of a lot better. Um, but but I, I do think that sometimes the conversation about the University of Georgia uh, really uh, creates a distraction for us. The Medical College of Georgia, i.e. the medical school, has four campuses throughout the state. Every single campus has been built in partnership with different institutions. Albany with Phoebe Putney Health System, Savannah with St. Joe's Candler, uh, Rome actually with a number of institutions, Floyd, Redmond, uh, and so on. And of course, the biggest uh, uh, campus is the one in Athens built in partnership with UGA. That is our LCME accredited branch. It is a branch of the Medical College of Georgia. And until anybody else says anything differently, that is our branch campus. But it's the only one of the branches that is a four-year potential four-year school. That, that is correct, uh, and that is an experiment. It's an experiment that uh, has been developing well, uh, but it is still an experiment, and all of us, Dr. Adams, myself, others, are obviously continuing to monitor and watch. Uh, but I am not going to tell you here that I can read the future, but I'm also going to tell you that certainly I do not see any read in the state, any willingness to make that an independent second medical school. I mean, this is a partnership that has been working well with UGA and our UGA colleagues, and I can't really tell you that I have a lot of complaints about that relationship today. Sure. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm going to go off of his second question 
and I'm an accounting person, so I deal with nuts and bolts and the actually what's going on. And when the Board of Regents announced this, almost immediately several state legislatures said, wait a minute, we need information, we need actual figures. So what is the actual process? Now that the Board of Regents does it, does the st state still have to sign off on it, or are the legislatures just saying this to show that they're trying to get reelected? The Board of Regents is a state constitutional entity. This doesn't, this doesn't, these, these consolidations do not have to be approved by the General Assembly. It is important for our elected officials to weigh in in different areas. Uh, our elected officials uh, have been kept abreast uh, and so on, but, but uh, Dr. Bloodworth is correct. This is a Board of Regents USG decision. Like many decisions at universities are presidential decisions. They just have to be made. This is not a legislative process. Laura. You mentioned the transition team that was going to be put together. And I don't know if it's been being formulated or not, but is there going to be any faculty representation on the transition team? Absolutely. That's Lots of it. That's what I want. It hasn't been formed <laughs> yet. Okay. Lots of it. Other questions? I mean, we have to have lots of questions because I have many more questions than answers. Uh, just anecdotally, my undergraduate degree has the name Augusta College, and I am no less proud of it for that. So, um, out of curiosity, I'd like to see how many Augusta State alums we have in the audience. Great, thank you. Did you have a question? Betty, thank you. Okay. We, we've heard about um, faculty involvement and student involvement, and could you speak to staff involvement in the process and whether or not staff will also be represented on this um, transition team? Well, uh, that answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> A letter from the chancellor says staff, staff, several categories of people, staff, one of the categories. So, so let, me, let me jump from that, uh, Susan, to answer another question that has been out there, and that is, how many layoffs are we going to have, and what is this going to mean for staff? I can't predict that either, but I'm going to tell you a few things that I think. We are relatively lean organizations. So there's not a lot of surplus staff running around. Two. This consolidation is primarily about growing a new research comprehensive university in Georgia. This is not, people have asked, uh, does everybody have to reapply for their jobs? No. Is everybody going to be given notice? No. What do we foresee as the number of layoffs. Well, there have to be some efficiencies that will be built in, but those will be relatively few on the initial part. We'll have to study this. But my impression just on first glance is that we have relatively lean organizations. We're not bloated. After many years of attrition and many years of budget cuts, we have become much leaner. So this is not something that staff should fear. In fact, remember, the goal of what we are creating is a new university, not, a, not an overgrown health sciences university, a new university, and the goal is to grow, to become bigger and larger, to employ more individuals, to have greater economic impact, to have a greater body of students, to have more faculty, more researchers, to be larger. This is not about shrinking anything. That would be a travesty. This is about growing. Growing the liberal art offerings, the business offerings, a lot of other colleges. Growing the health sciences. Back to the idea then if it's one you know, big university, uh, from a student perspective, um, each campus has um, excellent student facilities, uh, recreation facilities, and that sort of thing. So how 
uh, interchangeable will that be? Will students have universal access to both campuses, uh, athletics tickets, that sort of thing? Uh, just we'll, when, when, do we get a, when do we get a football team? Um, so. <laughs> It's it's football as it's understood elsewhere in the world. Uh, I think ultimately it will be one university. All the facilities will eventually be open to all students, including facilities still to be built, which we need in large measure. So it, it, we all have to envision that it is going to be one university. Now, many of us have been at large universities with multiple campuses, you know, and, and so the recreational facilities will have to be placed according to student convenience and so with housing and all those kind of things. But it will be one university with students having access to all facilities. Yeah, absolutely. So remember, this is, we're creating for the first time in many, many decades in Georgia a truly comprehensive research university. I mean, this is an extraordinary opportunity. But the vision is a one university. And if we want to start this process, I'll say that uh, any Georgia Health Sciences students who want to paint themselves blue <laughs> and sit in the student section at our basketball games will offer that for no admission right now. <laughs> there you go. We will, we will start doing some things relatively quickly with Dr. Bloodworth, and those are among those things. We do want to start supporting the JAGs. I've been there plenty, although don't understand always what happens. Remember, this is a sports injury that I have here. <laughs> there are a lot of things that we'll be doing over the next six months because we are going to be one university. I'm Denise Cornegay, and um, I would like to know how many of all of you are ASU faculty or staff who are here. I'd like to welcome you to our campus. Um, I'm terribly excited about this. <laughs> I think that the opportunities here are, are limitless. And one of the things that I'd like to see is some sort of plan on giving us opportunities to get to know each other. In meetings like this, we can ask y'all questions, but we don't get to know each other. And I think a series of networking you know, receptions or meals or something where the faculty and staff can begin to know each other as individuals would make this much more smooth in the transition. Right now, we don't know each other. And I'm looking forward to meeting colleagues at Augusta State University. And I think that probably people feel the same way coming back to get to know us. So I wanted to know if you guys had considered that or what you were going to do to give us opportunities to really meet each other and, and learn what we do. Well, I, I, you know, I'm going to speak first, and then I'd like Dr. Bloodworth's uh, 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 thoughts. You know, that is so critical, Denise. Uh, and we're going to be working very hard over the next few months to create that. Both social gatherings, sports, athletics, one-on-ones, uh, small group sessions, all of that is going to be created. Remember, we did that a lot with the integration of the clinical system and the university. We have experience. It's been extraordinarily productive. I mean, I can remember the first time we had a retreat for leadership across the board, and it was amazing that people would walk into a room and say, I didn't know you were here, or never seen you before, or, you know, who are you anyway? And it was extraordinary. And of course, it's still an ongoing process, right? 18 months later, we're still working at it because it takes years. So we have a way of doing this, and we have to begin to embrace this relatively soon. But again, we, Dr. Bloodworth and I, have not yet received our full marching orders. I think everybody needs to understand that to, to be a good general, you have to be really a great soldier. And of course, there are real generals in the audience, perhaps, so I just paraphrase that. But nevertheless, we do follow orders, but at the end of the day, that's critical, because it is going to be about collegiality, it's going to be about relationships, it's about feeling part of a larger university. I've been thinking that I could make a little speech about what we bring to the merger, you know, which might be the answer as to why are we so attractive if somebody wants to merge with us. We, what, things we don't bring, we don't bring many dollars to the table. Well, we, don't, we don't do that. Uh, but 
what we have developed. Well, we're very efficient. You know, we, we spend precious little money compared to other institutions of our current kind on administrative function. But we have a strong sense of collegiality, a sense of family. Some of that is, is a result of size, that it's simply possible to do that. We have on campus a number of events to which everybody is invited. The people, including the people who keep our buildings clean, keep our grass mowed, keep our lights burning, and so forth. Um, at holiday times, various times, we have, show you how it works. We have a sum total of about 600 employees, and about 100 of those persons are members of the so-called Presidents Club, which means that they give back $1,000 a year of their salary back to the institution. That's kind of remarkable that that percentage of people would do it, especially if they're not making very much money to begin with. Oh, uh, so I like that sense of family and collegiality. Now we have this much, much larger place. So we can't have these gatherings in the Maxwell Alumni House, can't have them in the Bernard Amphitheater, too many people. I don't know, maybe we can rent the Civic Center. <laughs> we can use Chris and Barry Fieldhouse. But you know, if we can bring this to the merger and somehow retain some of it, spread it, keep that sense of collegiality and family in this much, much larger family, it'll be a good thing. And, and I think those of you who are here at GHS, you know that we work hard to have this sense of family, despite the fact that we are 10,000 employees in the enterprise. Uh, we, we do try to work hard at maintaining a certain degree of uh, familiness, if you would. But it is going to be a challenge. I mean, I'm not going to pretend that all of a sudden, you know, the enterprise becomes a $1.2 billion enterprise with uh, 11,000 employees or so, and at that point, 10,000 students. That is a large university, and we'll all have to find that. But I will tell you that in order to be successful, each and every one of you will have to work hard at it. You can't just sit back and say, show me. You can't just sit back and say, do it for me. You can't just sit back and say, come and meet me. You will all, everybody, have to be part of this to be successful. Now, I, I do want to talk a little bit for a second about the fact that I have much to learn about ASU just as Dr. Bloodworth has much to learn about GHSU. And as you know, even on this campus, I spent a fair amount of time when I arrived here meeting with people and trying to listen to people. And now I'm actually on my second listening tour, meeting with different groups to understand what concerns now do we have 18 months later. And I'll have to be doing that a lot at Augusta State University. I need to learn a lot about their community and their culture, their challenges, their future, their desires and aspirations. So a lot of what we have to say today is based on relatively limited knowledge that, that I certainly have and, and Dr. Bloodworth is learning. So, yes, ma'am. In the spirit of collegiality, I'd like to thank Catherine Sweeney, who is your admissions director, for serving on our admissions uh, committee for uh, the replacement of uh, the admissions director for the medical school. And I think one of the things that we could do at a small, at a maybe a, you know, sort of a small level, person to person, is include people on searches, for example. That's a good way of doing it. And I, I would like to publicly acknowledge her for her willingness to, to be on that committee. Thank you. And in fact, uh, and Susan, uh, I want you to tell me, but about 70 to 80 percent of our search committees here for leadership in the last 18 months have included <laughs> colleagues from ASU. Uh, and in fact, uh, would you agree? We, we have um, uh, Dr. Sullivan served on the Provo Search Committee, Kathy Shedd serving on our um, Communications and Marketing <coughs> Committee, Mark Miller, is serving on our Communications and Marketing Committee, So we've been very... Um, uh, Chip Matson is serving on Search Committee, so we have had a wonderful um, relationship and very much appreciate everybody's um, commitment and willingness to serve. We also have the department chair of um, I believe it's um, communication serving on the communications and marketing as well. So we have had a great um, response from our ASU um, colleagues. We very much appreciate it. We are already starting from a great position. 
Both of our universities care much about our community. Both of our universities serve a similar, in many ways, uh, population, and also a diverse population. Both of our universities already work very closely together. Both universities root for the same sports team, athletic team. But the reality is we have much work to do. So I just simply want to thank everybody for coming in this morning. Uh, we will continue to speak about this in the next days, weeks, and months. But stay in tune, stay involved. It really will be up to you. Can I ask one question in the audience? How many, how many of you out there are students at either institution? How many students we have of you? Um, just, I'm, still, I'm still thinking just a little bit about what we bring to the merger. Um, we, we bring a special kind of attention to students. I'm going to cite one statistic. There was a survey known as the National Survey of Student Engagement, which attempts to understand how engaged students are with the universities that they attend. And there's a question on that survey that says uh, something like this. Um, do you get sufficient feedback from your instructor? And the average in the university system as a whole is 57%. 57% of students say yes. 75% of Augusta State students say yes. So we bring that to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.